Um, some of you have seen me wearing this sweater, the, the Grinch, and um, uh, actually this afternoon I'm planning on going home and watching the Grinch. Does any, anybody a, a fan of the Grinch? Right? Good. We got a, we got a few folks. Uh, Melanie, you're actually wearing a Grinch uh, shirt as well, so we got it going on. Uh, but, I, I, you know, my favorite rendition of the Grinch, because, I mean, it's been portrayed through, for years in, in different formats. We've had Jim Carrey. We've had... I, I don't know, different animations and those kinds of things. My favorite Grinch is still the original Dr. Seuss, How the Grinch Stole Christmas with the narration and, and the rhyming. I, I, I don't know why. I just, I love that one the most. So at some point, I will watch that one again this year. But, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit transparent this morning because, believe it or not, there are times now and, and times previous where I can be a little bit grinchy. Any, anybody relate with that? Any, anybody, sometimes you can, you can get a little bit grinchy? Yeah, I remember one time particularly, I was, uh, I was home with my sister while my parents were out. We were in high school back then, and so my parents trusted us to be home alone. And, you know, at that time in my life, I was having a, a lot of difficulty dealing with my grinchiness. Sometimes I would just get mad and, and not know how to handle it. Uh, give you an example. I, I remember one time uh, my aunt had bought me this really nice watch and uh, I was wearing it around in school. I wore it all the time and my wrist needed a break so I took it off and I, I put it under my chair uh, you know, so I wouldn't lose it type thing. And when the bell rang, I left third period and went to lunch and then realized at lunch my watch was gone. And so I ran all the way back to my third period class and I looked under my chair where I had left it and it was gone. And at, at that moment, the Grinch just came out. I mean, I was upset. I, I was angry. And on the way to my fourth period anatomy and physiology class, just this Grinch rage overtook me and I punched the brick wall walking down the hallway. And at that point, my hand just ripped right open. I mean, it was brick. It was blood everywhere. It was running down my hand. And when I went into the class, I asked the teacher if I could be excused, you know, and go get a Band-Aid and get it, get it taken care of, get paper towel. I mean, it was, it was all over the place. And, and she looked at me and said, what happened? And at that moment, I, I felt such embarrassment. I felt such shame because I, I didn't regulate my emotions well. I didn't cope well with the grinchiness that I was feeling. I said, I hit a wall. And I mean, there was, there was no, oh, poor you. There was no sympathy. There was nothing. It was like, that was stupid. And <laughs> just a stone face. <laughs> Get out of here. And, and so I went, I took care of my hand, and you know, it, it scabbed over real nice. But everywhere I went, people would then ask me, you know, what'd you do to your hand? And I'd have to bear the shame of my grinchiness. And I, I thought I made it, like, without my parents finding out. I mean, that first day when I went home, I tried to eat with my hand in my lap with my left hand, you know, because I did not want them knowing. And it went about a week, week and a half, and they hadn't said a word. And, and I had just gotten comfortable, and, you know, I, I guess I just forgot, and I left my hand out on the table, and my dad looked, and he goes, what are those scabs on your hand? And I had to... I had to share my grinchiness again. I had to, I had to wear the shame of that. And so we were, we were home that evening, and, uh, you know, my sister and I, I don't know what happened, but I got upset. And this time I had learned my lesson, right? When you let your grinchiness out, you don't hit walls. You find things that are softer. And so I found something that was hof- softer, and I hit it a little less hard, but it was the back of our wicker kitchen chair. And when I hit it, my hand went right through it. My, my fist just put this nice big old hole right through it. And at, at that moment, I realized this is going to be a problem because <laughs> I, I can't fix this. And, and I knew that not only would the chair be broke, but when my parents came home, I was going to have to share with them the Grinch that came out. I was going to have to share with them how I, I didn't handle my uh, anger or upsetness well and and I didn't cope and and left this 
hole in the chair and I was going to have to experience that, that shame all over again. And, and my parents, I tell you what, they came up with the worst punishment ever, all right? They didn't, like, make me work it off. They didn't ground me. They, they didn't charge me to fix the chair. Do you know what they did? They left it. They left the hole so that every time somebody came over to our house and said, what happened to your chair? I would have to relive that moment of shame. I, I would have to confess and share my lack of maturity all over again. Pointing us to this simple reality that, that this moment in my life, it, it's not solely attuned to me, but rather it's reflective of humanity as a whole because truth be told, of all of us, all our lives are complicated to some degree by shame and by fear. Some of us have things that we wear sometimes, be it a Grinch or something else that comes out and, and we're, not, we're not proud of. I mean, if we were to go in a, a counseling session right now and, and we were to ask the questions and, and peel back all the layers. I'm sure some of us would say, you know, I've got grinchiness in my life, or I'm, I'm ashamed of that, or I'm, I'm ashamed of this, and, and what's happened, and I'm afraid that people will find out. I mean, am, am I the only one? Does anybody else, you know, ever experience shame in their life? Ever, ever deal with things that they're not? Do you have something in your past, or maybe present right now, that, that you're not happy with, that maybe you're feeling a little bit of shame concerning? The reality is none of us are alone in, in this feeling, in, in this problem. In fact, uh, we go back to Genesis 3. We don't even get out of the first three chapters of the Bible, and, and we find this reality being portrayed. You can turn there with me if you like, but it, it is in this account that we begin to read about earth, God's earthly do domain. We, we begin to read about Eden here on earth. You see, the Scriptures... As, as they talk about God and, and describe how He works and, and those kinds of things, we, we begin to understand that God doesn't usually operate on His own. Even, even though He could, more often He chooses and likes to work with individuals and, and beings. We understand this uh, when He says in chapter 1, verse 26 of Genesis, He, he says, let us make human beings in our image in our likeness. And the us here, according to, to Michael Heiser, is, is the host of heaven. Those who comprise a, a God-like heavenly council. God is sharing His rule. And it gives us this understanding that, that God works with and through created beings, beings that are, are supernatural and, and that we are not always aware of. Just like when the angel came to visit Mary, God didn't show up directly to Mary, but he sent an angel to convey his message. M Mary, you're going to have a baby, and you're going to call him Jesus, and he's going to be the savior of the world. God didn't show up directly to Joseph and say, Joseph, don't, don't be afraid. Mary's going to have a baby, and, and you don't need to be afraid of that. It, that wasn't God showing up directly. God had sent another spiritual being, the angel Gabriel, to Joseph, just like he did with, with uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, just, just like uh, he did for the shepherds. God didn't show up directly, but he chose to work through other spiritual beings that, that were in his realm. So when he creates Adam and Eve in, in the scene world, in the material world, on earth, he operates in much the same capacity. He wants to partner with human beings. He gives them rule. He gives them dominion over his creation. He's sharing with them what, what he is and, and who he does, and he invites them into his works. So in verse 28, we read God saying to his creation, be fruitful and multiply, increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it. Almost 
as now is if he's got this heavenly council and now it seems to be the beginning of an earthly council sharing in his rule in this place known as Eden, the dwelling place of God. And the, the scripture tells us that it's not too long after and the woman he created, Eve, along with her husband come across this serpent. Okay, this is the Hebrew word nahash. But, but the imagery here isn't that just of a snake okay this is this is that of a divine being it's a, a, a divine being a, a, a guardian cherub because the snake speaks and I don't know about you but you know I've not spoken with many snakes 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 don't talk to me snakes snakes don't open their mouths and speak so it's clearly not just a snake but it is a divine or spiritual being with a divine or spiritual message that is when you eat from this tree you will be like God knowing good and evil and although Adam and Eve knew that they weren't supposed to eat from this tree because the Lord had told them they gave in to the temptation and they ate together and their eyes were open in the very first thing that they experienced was shame it was shame they were naked and afraid they were ashamed and they hid and you know isn't that just like some of us when we allow our grinchiness to come out when we allow those things in our life that we want to remain hidden when suddenly they they peek through don't we, don't we feel that shame? Isn't that our tendency then to, to hide and, and blend in and fly under the radar? Because if people knew, right? If people knew, if they really knew our heart and, and who we are and, and our character flaws and, and our past and what we've done or what we're curling, participating in, they might not like what they see. Again, this this brokenness, this shame, this fear, this, this reality that we're, we're living in, that, that Adam and Eve are experiencing at their time, and yet it's, it's right there. We, do, we don't even leave the first three chapters of Genesis. It's right there that we find an echo of Christmas, an echo that promises us that things won't always be this way. That, that one day, we will again have joy, just like the third candle we lit a moment ago. Christmas echoes bring us joy. Because you see, what happens immediately after Adam and Eve eat the fruit of what God had forbade them to eat because it would spell death for them, he says to the serpent, he says to the Nahash, this evil spiritual being, he says, cursed. Cursed. Are you above all livestock and all wild animals? You will crawl on their belly and you'll eat dust all the days of your life and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring or seed and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And if we're careful, we, we just read through that and we focus on the struggle, we focus on the negative, we, we focus on the, oh no, all this bad has happened and, and we miss it. But listen, God is cursing this spiritual being. God is cursing this. Nowhere do you read of Adam and Eve being cursed. He doesn't say cursed are you, Adam. He doesn't say cursed are you, Eve. He says cursed are you, speaking to the serpent, speaking to the Nahash, the, the deceiver. And while he may trip us up and, and, and cause us to feel shame from time to time and, and buy into his lies or, or uh, things that where he says and whispers to us that, you know, it's not really that big of a deal. Or, you know, you can't do any better than that. Or God doesn't really love you. And if, if he did, why does he allow these things to happen in your life? Eventually, the scripture wants us to understand his head will be crushed. That's the reality that we're reading about. You follow me? Almost from the beginning, his doom is spelled out. And while certainly the actions of humanity, even our actions today, do have consequences, sometimes we still experience shame and, and fear and, and wanting to hide, sometimes that happens. Maybe even now, we can have joy because God doesn't leave us there. God doesn't leave us in, in that brokenness. 
Because you see, this, this offspring or seed of the woman that Scripture talks about in verse 15 is an echo of, of Jesus. Jesus who is in the direct line of Adam according to Luke chapter 3. Where we read about Joseph who is to be his earthly father, who, who, who was to help raise him. He was the son of Heli, the, the son of Mahat, who was the great-grandson of Jeni, the great-great-grandson of Nahum, the great-great-great-grandson of Semine, and right on down the line to Methuselah and Enoch and Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. From the beginning, God spoke of Satan's defeat the curseness of the Nahash, and that one day his head would be crushed. How even now he is living with that knowledge, his shame, his shame, and how we too can live with that same knowledge. I mean, just, you know, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, he, he echoes this, he speaks it in, in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, where the scripture says, and the God of peace... Remember last week, the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. And so get this, when when we find ourselves tempted to give in to shame, when when we find ourselves like uh, tempted to give in to shame, or when we struggle or, or, or those kinds of things, we can remind ourselves of how God has been faithful in our lives, even from the very beginning, to send Jesus. Prophesied throughout history, God made flesh to be the agent through which all of humanity's shame could be removed so that we could again experience the joy of being in relationship with Him. You follow me? Satan is a defeated foe. and We knew that. From the very beginning, we don't have to hide or pretend to be anything more than we are. And that is in need of rescue, because it's true, we're all broken. We all have a grinchiness sometimes that comes out. We all have a shame that we sometimes bear. And Satan or the deceiver, the Nahash, tries to keep our focus on that. He tries to keep us hiding and hidden in our shame because he knows the only way that he can keep us from experiencing joy is by our choosing to hide. But my friends, God doesn't leave us in our brokenness. Rather, like in the garden, he says, come out. Come out. That's what he said to Adam and Eve. Where are you? Come out because he already knows. He already knows our shame. He already knows the sweaters we're wearing. And he's got a plan. He had a plan for Adam and Eve. And when we see the baby in the manger at Christmas time, it is a reminder of the curse. Not the curse on Adam, not the curse on Eve, but the curse on Satan and his shame. And that in the garden, God went looking for Adam and Eve just like he sent Jesus to come and look for us, to call us out of hiding, to rescue us, from our shame. Oh, that's good. That's good. And I want you to know it gets better. As we read and we follow along and we look at, at what God has done through the scriptures and, and, and how He's revealed His plan to us, it gets better. So much better. In fact, can you say that with me? It gets better. That's good. Say it again. Say, it gets better. Yes. And I do that not to have control over you or to say, hey, look at the show. I do that because when we repeat things, it's a memory tool. It it etches them in our mind. And if we're going to have joy, we need to etch in our mind what the Word of God says. We need to take advantage of this Christmas echo because while Satan came to work shame and bring about suffering in God's beloved creation in his his human counsel and family whom he desired to to share uh, dominion with while he wanted us to be bound by fear and hide uh, from God God had a plan in Jesus to undo the works caused by the enemy caused by this spiritual being which is the second reason for joy In this Christmas season, we can have joy because Jesus undoes the works caused by the enemy. That's what he does. This is what we read in 
Isaiah chapter 29, verses 18 through 19, hundreds of years before this baby was to be born in this specific manger on this specific night, who would grow up to have a a very unique and power-filled ministry, the prophet said, in that day, in that day, the deaf will hear the words of the scroll. And out of gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. Once more, the humble will rejoice in the Lord. The needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Now, Fast forward a few hundred years. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, is in prison. And while he's in prison, he says to his followers, I want you to go out and find who this Jesus really is been doing all these amazing powerful things and and I, I need you to go out and find out who he is and so his followers go out and they 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 go to Jesus and they ask hey John he, he wants to know are you the one who was to come are you the Messiah are you the one who's gonna crush the head of Satan that was predicted in, in G, Genesis chapter 3 and foretold by Isaiah. Were, are you the one who's to come or should we expect somebody else? Because John knew what the Messiah had come to do. And Jesus' response was, go back and report to John what you hear and what you see. What you actually watch me doing. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear and the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. In other words, Jesus is undoing the curse brought on humanity. He was removing their shame. He was removing their disgrace and the consequences of it. It was a fulfillment of the echo in Isaiah 29. And in case that's not clear enough for us to buy into, hear the Apostle John in 1 John 3, 7 and 8, who Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous, referring to Jesus. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, the Nahash, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy or undo the works of the devil. You and I can have joy this morning because Jesus undoes the works caused by the enemy. He takes away our guilt. He takes away our shame. He heals and he still speaks good news and he comforts and he delivers. I was in a prayer meeting uh, a couple Wednesdays ago and uh, we we were talking and uh, Gerald Howard was there. I don't know if you know Gerald Howard from her service, but... He's, he's been struggling with these neurological issues where when a loud noise happens or goes off, it causes him to jerk or to shake uncontrollably. And, and some of these have been really bad. And I was up there preaching, and there was a pop in our sound system. It sounded a little bit like a gun going off. And, and Gerald went into one of these little episodes, and he started jerking and shaking, and he couldn't come out of it. And Pastor Ray put his hand on Jared's shoulder and, and just began to pray for the presence of God and the peace of God to come over him and stop jerking, stop shaking. And and Gerald started talking about last Wednesday morning how he hadn't had one of those jerking episodes since. He hadn't had one in such a long time. They're, They're not that bad anymore. And I believe that's an answer to prayer. I believe that God touched him and I believe that he's still at work. And I know he's still at work because I've experienced a similar process in my life where it's not an instantaneous healing but it's a gradual healing and I believe that's gonna happen in Gerald's life and, and whether that healing comes instantly is a process is worked through the hands of another or doesn't happen until ultimately we are in the fullness of the presence of Jesus of this we can be confident that that he has and is presently undoing the works of the enemy of Satan of the Nahash, and because of that, we can have joy. And so if I can this morning, I want to take it a step further, because here's what we find in the New Testament after this baby in the manger grows up. In John 
14, Jesus is having a conversation with one of his followers by the name of Philip. And honestly, Philip is struggling a little bit to, to understand and believe who Jesus really is. Kind of like we struggle sometimes. Kind of like our family struggles. Kind of like our friends struggle and our coworkers struggle. He's struggling with a little bit to, to understand who Jesus really is. And so Jesus says to Philip in verse 11, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Believe that I am Emmanuel. Or at least believed on the evidence of the works themselves. What, what I've been undoing. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And they will do even greater works than these because I, ha because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for anything in my name and I will do it. And again, what we're seeing here is, is how God... Oh God, Emmanuel, for whatever reason, it's crazy, it's hard to believe, but he chooses agents like you and me to work through, both human and divine. Literally, he's inviting Philip and the rest of the disciples, as well as followers of Jesus in general, to join in with him in the works, in undoing the works caused by the enemy. And I, I'm telling you, as we see in the scriptures, that not only do we find joy in our understanding of what Jesus is doing, but we find joy in actually participating with him. Some of us experienced this a, a few weeks ago when we were out ringing the bell in, in front of Ingalls. Jingle, 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 jingle. Jingle, 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 jingle. We're out there ringing that bell. And people would come up and, and they'd give and we'd smile and they'd smile and we'd say, thank you, some of you all wore some crazy Christmas sweaters out there. I remember uh, seeing Lisa out there and, you know, as you were jingling the bell and people, we, I remember I waving and you had a big smile on your face as, as you waved back and, and we were happy in our service and what we were doing because, because the money that was given was going to help families in need, families who were hurting, families who may be, have even experienced shame. We were literally undoing the works of of the Nahash. And, and you know, uh, yesterday at Toy Shop, we served over a, a hundred kids, right? We, we made their Christmas a little bit brighter. We gave them a little bit more joy and we prayed with people and we heard their stories and we stopped and we took time to notice and time to listen. And whether, whether we feel like we did anything or not, I'm confident that everybody who walked through these doors was able to experience a little bit of the undoing of the works of the enemy. And, and whether it's serving as an usher week after week or investing in our student ministry space through our next gen renovation or volunteering at Ripple of One or donating to Grace's Closet, when we participate in undoing the works of the enemy with Jesus, we find joy. It's, it's the reality of doing life with Him. We don't have to live in the shame. We don't have to live in the fear and the temptation to hide and seclude ourselves. What's well, already been dealt with because God sought us out in baby Jesus coming to earth. The baby Jesus who undo the works of Satan and invite us to share in his work and in his rule and, and, and be a part of his kingdom. But listen to me, friends, because it goes a little bit further, and I want to draw attention to this in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 10 to 12, because it's here that we see almost a, a culmination or a reversal of Genesis 3. You see, while the Nahash worked to separate us from God, the Holy Spirit, speaking through Isaiah, says, in that day... The root of Jesse, the descendant of David, the root of Jesse, a messianic title for Jesus, will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the, the surviving remnant of his people from Assyria. 
from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and, and from the islands of the Mediterranean. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. And what I love about this scripture, what I love about this picture being painted is the, the size and the scope of what God is doing, of what Jesus is going to do. Notice we have this imagery of Jesus as a banner. It says, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner. And if you look up the Hebrew word for banner, it means to be lifted up on a pole as a rallying point or a standard. And I read that, and I can't unsee Jesus lifted up on a pole, on a cross, after he grew up, a cross that would serve and continues to serve as a rallying point for his followers, for Christians, as a signal or symbol for generation after generation after generation. And the thing about this banner, this Jesus lifted up on this pole is that it's not just for the Jews. It's not just for the different people groups listed here. It's for all peoples of all backgrounds, the, the whites, the Hispanics, the black folks, and everywhere in between. But the text says he's a rallying point, a signal of salvation for the nations, plural, which means we can have joy because Jesus is drawing all people to himself. All people. This is the picture that, that we get in Luke 2. It's the echo when Jesus is born. Verse 8 tells us that at his birth there were shepherds living out in the, the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock. And if you know anything about shepherds, man, when there was a party going on, when there was a get-together going on, when there was a celebration and a meal, the shepherds often didn't get to come. Somebody had to watch the sheep. Somebody had to make sure that they were okay. And so the shepherds were always kind of out on their own. They were always kind of left out of things. And, and being out in the wilderness so much, I, I guess they might have began to take on some wildernessy type odors and those kinds of things. And they weren't kind as clean as everybody else. And some people, they looked down on shepherds. They looked at shepherds and said, yeah, they're a little bit lesser than, than the rest of us. And maybe even there was, there was a, a piece of shame associated there as different cultures would look down on them. They were the, the riffraff viewed as less than the nobodies. And the scripture tells us that while these shepherds were out in their fields being forgotten about, maybe even hiding or experiencing this shame, an angel of the Lord appears to them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were terrified. But the angel says to them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for who? all people today in the town of david a savior has been born to you he's the messiah the lord and suddenly a, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising god and saying glory to god in the highest on earth peace to those whom his favor rests you, you follow me here are you, are you getting the picture of what's going on jesus wasn't about drawing or reaching the well-to-do people in his society. This message didn't come to the, the spiritual religious leaders or, or the kings of that day. It, it came to the lowliest of the lowliest, regular people, not people of a certain age group or people of a particular lifestyle or of a certain country. He didn't come just to save Christians or Muslims or Hindus or people of other religious backgrounds, but he came as a banner. He came as a banner, a rallying point for all peoples. Drug addicts, tattoo enthusiasts, those with a passion for body art, well-educated folk, just, just as well as simple folk. Jesus came for everyone, for you and for me, for everyone. Which says to me, if, if Jesus is about drawing all people to himself, and if he invites us to join in in undoing the works of the enemy and building his kingdom, we should be about drawing and welcoming all people as well. 
right? We need to deal with our prejudices and our biases and those things that hang us up. And hey, that, that person, they're a little bit shameful. There's some things in their life that I don't know that I want to be. Jesus has dealt with that. And he invites us to undo the works of the enemy. Does that not express what Jesus is about? I mean, the name of our church is welcome. Hello, here's your sign. It's the name of our church. And when we live up to that name, when we really give ourselves over to what Jesus has done and is doing, joy is what we find. Are you tired of hiding? Are you, are you tired of, of, you know, keeping that fear in, in that guilt in that shame inside maybe it's grinchiness maybe it's something else listen you don't have to hide you don't have to hide like Adam and Eve God already knows he knows he knows we're broken and he invites us to come he invites us to come and be a part of what God has done and is doing and so let's undo let's join with let's undo the, the things that we see happening around us that are a result of the fall, that are a result of guilt, that are a result of shame. Let's work together to draw people to him, not just some, but everyone. Let's reach out to everybody. The crazy Uncle Joes and the silly Aunt Sallys. Let's join God in undoing the works of the enemy because even if it's hard, even if it's uncomfortable, I guarantee when a person responds to Jesus, when they fall down on their face at the foot of, of the banner that's been raised of Jesus, all of heaven rejoices. All of heaven rejoices. And when heaven rejoices, I don't want to stand there with my hands in my pockets in a grinchy sweater. I want to rejoice with the heavens and Jesus invites me to do that I want to be a part of that and the best news ever is that we can be because Jesus invites us to experience joy and so if you're here this morning if you're watching online either right now or sometime during the week and you're living in the shadows it's time to come out it's time to come out of the shadows. It's time to come out of hiding and choose to live in the joy that God has made possible for each of us. Because He's here. He hasn't abandoned us. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. Jesus who undoes the works of the serpent and draws all people to Himself. And my friends, that's worth celebrating.